of the Corinth Baptist Church in the Chapel Hill area of Tyler, Texas. We're delighted to be able to be with you this morning on the prayer line and on Facebook to share a word, especially in times like this, when we are suffering under this pandemic called coronavirus. But we trust that God has uh, surrounded you with his love and covered you with his grace so that even now in times like this, that you will be able to tell a dying world that there is a reality in serving the true and the living God. So we pray and trust that God has given you strength to match whatever adversity that comes before you. We're grateful to Dr. Hart, who has given the Sunday School lesson on the prayer line and hopefully on Facebook. But if it's not on Facebook now, you can get it on Facebook later on this afternoon. We're grateful to him Amen. for his uh, service to the kingdom and that he is providing that service through our church, Corinth Baptist Church. We are very blessed to have him with us, and we recognize that. And we thank God for allowing him to be with us in this season. And now a word from the Lord for today, this Easter Sunday, or those of us who are in the body of Christ, this Resurrection Sunday, the Sunday that we uh, realized that our hope in Christ was born anew. We thank God for this day. For our message today, our text will come from the book of Romans chapter 4. And the verse, we'll only read one verse, and that's verse 25. That is Romans, the book of Romans, chapter 4, and verse 25. It says there, Who was delivered for our offense, and was raised again, for our justification. Amen. So reads the word of God. Grass withereth and the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. From this text, we want to talk uh, from the subject of the significance of the resurrection. The significance. What does it mean to me? We know that uh, he was raised from the dead, and we celebrate that, especially now preaching how he was raised and got up, and we celebrate that, and that is good. He was brought back to life, never to die again, but the um, thing that we need to know is what does that mean to me? What does that mean to me right now in the life that I'm living in this world, and what does that mean to me when my life here is over and I am translated to the other side. In order to understand and get an appreciation of the resurrection, we need to look at the reason why Jesus died. And I say died, but in reality, he was killed. And I know that's a harsh term, but that's the term Jesus used when he talked to his disciples in Mark chapter 9, 31, when he said to them uh, that, uh, for he taught his disciples and said unto them, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. He was killed, and then also Paul, when he was preaching on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 3, 
verse 14 and 15, Paul said, uh, but ye deny the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life whom God has raised from the dead whereof we are witnesses. We don't like to use that term, but I want to use today because we want to, you to get an understanding of the horrific death that Jesus experienced. He died because he was killed. He was killed by men who did not want him to exercise his influence over the people that they considered to be theirs. So he was killed. But in reality, he allowed them to kill him. He had the power not to submit to that. As a matter of fact, when they approached him in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Peter took out his sword and was going to defend him. And he said, put up your sword. If I wanted to, my father would send a legion of angels to deliver me at this time. But it was not his will or the will of the father for him to escape this that he was facing. But now why was he killed? Why did he die? It was decided in the councils of eternity past, before the earth and the world was formed, knowing that man, when he would be created, was going to sin and fall from the grace of God, God developed a plan to redeem man even before the world began. And the plan was that, that even though man sinned and the penalty for that sin would be death, but because Jesus wanted to have fellowship with us and relationship with us, he did not allow the sinner to die personally. He permitted a substitute to die in his place so that the requirements would be fulfilled that for every sin a life must be paid. But he allowed a substitute. He did that in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. He killed an animal and took the skin of that animal and made them aprons to cover their nakedness. And so God has provided a substitute. But then in Hebrews, it tells us that God got tired of the blood of the substitute to, because the blood of the substitute was not sufficient to remove man's sin. It only covered it. It's kind of like when you buy something on credit, on your credit card. You get the benefit of it, but it's not paid for. It's just covered. The credit card covers it, but it's not paid until you pay the credit card bill. So the sins of man was just covered by the blood of animals, but had not yet been paid. It had to have a perfect sacrifice in order for that sin to be removed and for that debt to be paid. And it was decided in councils past, in eternity past, that Jesus would come and be that perfect sacrifice to not only die and be killed and die for the sins of man, to take away that sin and to pay that debt, but that he would also be brought back to life again. Now, Jesus did come through the councils of men. And the Bible said in our text that he was delivered for our offense. And we were delivered would mean he, in order for him to be delivered, there had to be a deliverer. And the one who delivered Jesus in order for him to be killed and to die for our sins was God the Father. The same one who delivered him is the one who raised him. Now, he delivered them for our offense. But then it said he raised him again. And the again brought to my mind, what did he mean by raise him again? And then I realized that raise means to be brought to life and to cause to appear to men. And that happened one time when he was born of the Virgin Mary. He was raised and presented to the world at that time. But then, during the crucifixion, he died. He was killed and he died. And then Jesus brought him back. God brought him back to life again. 
He was raised, he was, rather he died for our offenses, for the sins that would have been committed by men even before the world began. All sin that man would commit would be paid for by the death of Jesus. And any of us and all of us are included in that because the Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that is in uh, John 3.16. But in, in 1 John 1 and 8 it said that if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar because in, uh, in, in John 3.15 he said that all have sinned. And then he said in, 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 in 1 John 1 and 10 that if we say we have no sin, and that's right now, we're only fooling ourselves. So he died to pay for all of our sins, my sins, your sins, and the sins of mankind, all that came, sins that were committed before he died, all the sins that were committed while he was dying, and all the sins that are committed after his death was paid for when he was killed and died on that cross. That's why he was died. That's why he died. He came and he died. But the question has to be asked, why then should we place our hope in Jesus as being our perfect sacrifice? And we place our hope in him because there's evidence that God accepted Jesus as our sacrifice. For if he had not accepted Jesus as our sacrifice, if Jesus had done something that disqualified him from being the perfect sacrifice, we would still be in our sins. But we believe that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. And the evidence that we rely on to make this is the fact that, number one, God raised him from the dead. He raised him from the dead as a sign that he was satisfied with Jesus as our perfect sacrifice. And the fact that he raised him from the dead is a great indication, great evidence that he was satisfied. But that's not the only thing. In the scriptures, in Isaiah 53, verse number 5, it said, He was bruised for our iniquities. He was wounded for our transgression. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. <clears throat> but then in verse number 11, it said, And he, the Father, shall see the travail of his soul, and then be satisfied. So that's the second evidence that in the word that God was satisfied with Jesus dying as our sacrifice. In our text, it says God raised him from the dead. In Isaiah chapter 53, God said he shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. But those are not the only evidences that we have that God was satisfied with Jesus dying as our sacrifice. Not only did he raise him from the dead, but he allowed him to stay here for 40 days after he was raised from the dead, so that everybody could see that he was raised. A sufficient number of persons could see that he was raised. And he was raised with a different kind of body, a, re a resurrected and a glorified body. With that body, he could go through walls. He was not subject to the physical things of this earth. He had a glorified body, the same kind of body we will have when we see him. But after he was stayed here 40 days talking about the kingdom, God allowed Jesus to do what he allows any sacrifice that he accepts to do. You see, God doesn't accept every sacrifice, did not accept every sacrifice during the time of the sacrificial period. If God did not accept the sacrifice, no sweet savor would rise into the presence of God. But if he accepted the sacrifice, a sweet savor would rise into the presence of God. So when God allowed Jesus to stay here for 40 days so that we could see that he was, re was raised from the dead, then Jesus, God allowed Jesus to do what he does in his sacrifice he accepts. He allowed him to rise, to ascend into his presence. 
which is another indicator that we have that God was satisfied with Jesus as our perfect sacrifice. <clears throat> but before that, even when he was raised from the dead, he sent word to his disciples who were in Jerusalem to meet him in Galilee. Now, that was kind of a strange request because he was in Jerusalem and they were in Jerusalem. He knew where they were. They were in the upper room, shut up for fear of their own lives. But he did not speak to them directly. He sent word by Mary to tell his disciples who were in Jerusalem at the time he was in Jerusalem to meet him in Galilee. And I wondered, why would he have them meet him in Galilee? And second, why would he not have appeared to them himself and communicated? Well, I discovered what he was doing was establishing his new economy, the new method that he would communicate with man, no more face-to-face, -face, but it had to be done by faith. Faith is the new economy that was established then, and faith is the economy that's in effect now that we communicate with Jesus and through prayer in faith. So he had to send the word, and they had to believe what somebody told them he said, and they'd be willing to act on that belief to go a hundred miles on foot just to have a meeting with him. So they had to have faith, and this was the establishment of the new economy. Second reason why he sent word was that if he had told them to meet him uh, on the corner, meet him somewhere there in Jerusalem, they could have done that out of curiosity. But Jesus wanted them to exercise their faith and to be willing to endure whatever required for them to meet the request. So he said, meet him in Galilee. And he did that because only those who was willing to bear the burden of the journey and the heat of the day of the journey and to be willing to go the extra mile would be those that he would count on to carry on his ministry. So when he got there, they discovered that he was there. He met them there, though somebody did not believe. But when he got there, he gave them the great commission. And remember, he gave the commission to those who was willing to come from Jerusalem to Galilee by faith, endure the difficulty of the journey in faith, and therefore demonstrating they were willing to do what's necessary to obey the word of their master in carrying out the duty. So he could count on them and he gave them the command, those who was willing to bear the burden of the trip and the extra problems they encountered in doing what he required of them. And uh, then those are the ones that he is counting on today to carry the word those who are willing to bear the burden, to go the extra mile, and to not let anything keep them from obeying the will of their master. And that's why there are so few of us who are involved in evangelism, because we are not willing to bear the burden. We're not willing to go the extra mile. We're not willing to experience the difficulty. And God is not counting on those who are not willing. But God has never left himself without a witness. There are always going to be some who are willing to bear the burden, who are willing to go the extra mile to do what the master has required of them. But when they got there, Jesus told them that all power in heaven and earth had been given or transferred to him. That's another indicator that God was satisfied with Jesus dying. He would not have transferred all power into Jesus' hand if he was not satisfied. I know that in our preaching sometimes we say he got up, 
with all power. But the word says that somewhere between the resurrection in Jerusalem and the meeting with the disciples in Galilee, all power was transferred into his hand. It was given to him. And the reason it was given to him, we believe, is because God was satisfied with Jesus dying as our sacrifice. But that's not the only reason. There's another reason. After he was ascended into heaven, God sat him down on his right hand, his hand of authority. He would not have sat him down on his right hand and given him authority if he was not satisfied with him being our perfect sacrifice. So that's another indicator that Jesus was sat, God was satisfied with Jesus as our sacrifice. And then not only when he sat him down, he gave him the authority and the position to be our intermediary and to make intercessions for us unto him. So when we pray to God, we pray in Jesus' name. He is our intercessor, another indication that he was satisfied with Jesus. So we believe that Jesus is our acceptable sacrifice indicated by the fact that God raised him from the dead, said it in his word, and given other infallible proofs that he is our sacrifice. So then the resurrection means that Jesus had removed the barrier that separated us from God, which was sin. And then all we need to do is to do what's required of us, and that is to confess with our mouth, that Jesus is our Lord, that we have given our lives to him and demonstrate that we have by being obedient to his will, then he will save us, deliver us from our offenses and he will give us a seat in heaven and we will be able to forever live in eternity with God in that city where the streets are paved with gold. And he said in his word that he's going to prepare a mansion for us. Some say, well, it's not a mansion. It's a room. It's a dwelling place. Well, I don't care where it is. It's a mansion because there are no shacks in the city that has streets paved with gold. So I'm looking forward to that. So another for us to live not only in that city where the streets are paved with gold, but have benefits of being in the family of God while we're here on earth. We need to make Jesus our Lord in order to take advantage of the way that he has made for us to be delivered from the consequences of our sin and to have peace Amen. with God. So the resurrection has significance to us. It tells us that we are safe and we are wise when we trust Jesus to deliver us from the consequences of our sin based on the work that he's done in Cal on Calvary and to, and to provide for us while we're here in this world today. He does that. That's what he did for Job. You remember when Satan said, I, I, I can't touch Job because you built a hedge around him. Well, God does that for us now. He has protection all around us. I think the song says, all day and all night, the angels are encamped around us. God protects us in this world right now. There are many of us who probably have already been affected by the coronavirus and have recovered and didn't even know we had it. God has put a hedge of protection around us. Every day as we go up and down the street, God removes problems from the highway that we didn't even know were there. That's why we're able to reach our destination in safety and come back to our destination and find all we left in this care well in order. God protects us. That's a benefit of the resurrection. He, 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 he was raised for our justification. And by justification means that he was raised so we could be declared right with God. And we are declared right with God when we make Jesus the Lord of our lives. We cannot be right with God any other way. In the Old Testament, we could be right with God when we made a sacrifice or when we made restitution for the wrong that we have done. When we, but there's a time when we cannot make restitution for the wrong because the person that we have wronged is no longer there. So that does not work 
in modern day. So God had to have another way, and that way is to declare us right based on the life that Jesus lived. When we give our life to Jesus, we are covered then by the blood of Jesus. And when God looks at us, he does not really see us. He sees Jesus' blood that covers us, and that makes us right with him. And when we sin after we are saved, we are no longer sinners. We need to stop calling ourselves a sinner, saved by grace, but a sinner nevertheless. Because once we're saved, we belong to God as a saint. And a saint is different from a sinner. A sinner is one who's never A sinner is one who's never been re delivered from the consequences of our sins. A saint is one who has been delivered from the consequences of our sins. A saint is one who has delivered their life into Jesus' hand. But even after that, we sin. But when we sin, we do not lose the relationship. We lose, we lose the benefit of God's protection of us here while we are on earth. But God has fixed it so that we could get that protection back. If we use what I call a monkey wrench that God gives us, that's something that we can use to fix anything that is broken between us and God. And that monkey wrench is repentance. If we just repent of our sins, then God will bring us back into the fellowship, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and love us again as his children. So the resurrection has significance to us. It paved the way for us to get our sin debt paid so that there would be no barrier between us and God. And once the barrier is removed, we take advantage of what God has done by providing Jesus as our Lord. And once we make him our Lord, confess him as our Lord, then he will become our I am, which means he will be for us whatever we need him to be. And at the moment we confess him as our Lord, our most urgent need is a Savior, and he will become our Savior, delivering us forever from the consequences of our sin, giving us forever a seat in the kingdom, which we re realize when this life is over, for he will meet us in that dying hour, cross us over to the other side, to that place that he's prepared for us. So the resurrection is significant for us. It means that we have a way to be in relationship and fellowship with God, not only in this life, but in the life to come. Thank you, sisters and brothers. This is our message. For today, and we thank God for you, and thank God for this opportunity to be with you by way of Facebook and by way of the prayer line. Amen. Amen. Amen.